Hey everybody, welcome to Bedroom Beethoven's episode number two. I'm your host, Marcello. As always, we got a really good one, folks. My man Confidence joins me in the booth. That name can refer to several ideas and concepts, but if you apply it to the world of beat making and you have a term that exudes high standards and carefully composed compositions, man, what a fitting name for a hip-hop producer who has just that. My guest this week is an authentic golden era hip-hop producer bringing back that 90s feel with an updated sound. He was born in Philly back in 77, so you know he's no stranger to classic-sounding hip-hop and authentic street anthems. But nowadays, my boy's repping. Boston, Boston, Boston. Cleaver rap is teary eyed. Tried most who came and thought they had tried. You were custom to cussing and bluffing, fussing for nothing. Half of y'all crumbs are just soft like muffins. I bake masterpieces, sharper thesis. Y'all candy coated motherfuckers stink like thesis. Needless to say, all these runners shoes. All right, episode two of Bedroom Beethoven's. Let's get into it. It's a mystery brick wall. Silent in and out, you slept, so now snore. Who got my back, you ass lord? What's up, kid? How you doing? Man, I am doing great. Man, I'm I'm a fan of yours. I'm I'm a big fan, in fact. And I could just use the internet to reach out to you directly and boom. And I know. Look at that. You're kind enough soul to lend me a bit of your time, and here we are. Why not? Why not, man? I have a funny story about how I learned about you. I I, I fell down this this musical rabbit hole and I came across the Rashad and Confidence album. And I, I loved it all the way through. And I'm I'm a vinyl nut, so I was like, oh man, then let me let me try to buy this vinyl. And then I realized there's a gold vinyl that is super rare. I'm sure you're aware of that. And yeah. I tried to buy it and there was only one seller, and it was actually a guy that works at Fat Beats. It was like the official seller of of your distribution. And he was price gouging me, man. He wouldn't sell it to me for under three digits. And I was like, come on. Wow. And, and he said, hey, you're never going to find another one like this on the market. Uh, you know, I got to do it to you. And I, you know, I don't blame him. It's a great record, but I'm still wow. on the hunt. <laughs> oh, so you were like, nah, it's a great record, but I ain't paying that much. I mean, maybe I would if I was in a better financial situation, but yeah, it, yeah. it's still on my want list. And I've been a fan ever since I've been kind of following your music. So w- when wow. I started this podcast, you know, you were obviously on my my list. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate you thinking of me. No worries, man. Did you did you catch the Grammys last night? No, I don't I don't partake in those activities. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm finding that that most people don't. It's like in fact, you know, the Grammys have been around for 60 years. Hip hop's been around for 40 years and it feels like hip hop only has really cared about the Grammys the last 4 or 5 years if that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I mean, if I did that type of music, I'd probably be like, oh man, this motherfucking one, you know, but you know, I don't, I don't do that. And it doesn't, the music just doesn't appeal to me. That's really the bottom line. It's, it's, it's like pop music. And Do you have any like uh, opinion on why like no woman has ever won Grammy for producer of the year? Who, who what women producers are doing it like that? I, you know, that's a good question. Like, why, why is it so male focused? You know, it's male focused. I know because I mean, it always has been. Really, I mean, I overall, yeah, there's women, but there's more like women rappers than there are producers. Like, there's women. I've seen women producers, but I mean, if I was a, a male artist, if I found a woman producer, I'd be like, yo, like, we got, let's do something different here because like, there's nobody like you out there. Let's let's let me get you on or like let me. He gets you some shine because it's going to attract more attention because it's different. Because majority majority of men who make beats and rap, I mean, it's like a man's sport, I guess. Like women can do it too, but it's just it's just not in the spotlight like that. Now, then, I'm I'm never going to say something to a guest that I would only say because I'm in front of in front of them. You, your sound, I, I read somewhere that it's about as hip hop as hip hop can sound, and that might seem vague to some people who are listening like to this. Yeah, but I like that. and I agree with that. It resonated with me because that underground, that that East Coast sound, it's the style of production that uh, it's timeless. You know, it's that sound that I think hip hop will always need. Like you said, you know, I don't fuck with the Grammys because maybe that you know 
Metro Boomin or whatever, that's, that's the type of sound that might only last for five years. I don't see that sticking. But your sound, that boom bap, it's timeless, you know? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and that goes for all music that has that feel. Like, it is timeless. It never get old. Like, you know, I'm sure you, like myself, were still listening to music back then. It still sounds good. I mean, some stuff doesn't stand the test of time, but there's plenty of it that does, like to you as a person, and that shit will never get old. It just won't get it old. It always sounds good. Yeah. What, what's more important to you as a producer, like uh, climbing the rap charts, collaborating with legends, or like developing new artists and talent? Well, you know, someone that grew up during, you know, the 90s, and actually I started making beats in the 90s, um, I always wanted to work with artists that I grew up listening to. That was like always my main thing. Like, yeah, like, you know, that type of that type of thing. Um, but I don't know, man. Like, it's tough because uh, like the Rashad album didn't really get the recognition on that level, which we were hoping for. Like some, you know, it established dudes would be like, yo, man, I heard this joint, man, we need this right now. Stuff like that. Like, we didn't really get much of that. And um, I don't know. I I guess, in a sense, like, finding new artists is equal because, like, the Rashad thing. I mean, like, no one knew me, and no one knew him. And then, you know, we got on, and look, look what you want to interview me because of it. So, like, maybe, um, you know, long-winded answer finding the right talent and, and finding your own lane because then eventually everything comes like kind of full circle at some point or another. And, and you found him like on the mixtape circuit, I imagine, cause you guys were unknown. That's right. We're unknown. I mean, you know, I did stuff locally. I, I sold beats here and there, but like nothing ever like really popped off, but that was the first shit. But you like you like like hey I'm gonna, I want to work with this guy and do a whole album with him like do you like uh, complete bodies of work rather than create a beat selling it or or doing a, a single for somebody is there something yeah. more fulfilling than just doing a complete project Yeah, complete project because I mean you know if done right it's the total package you know what I mean and like you said shit could be timeless if it's done right and so. While a single is like, yeah, that was a little single. Like, but look at all the great singles. They were all on like great albums. You know what I mean? Like from back then. Like, I, I would rather do, you know, like a, a full project. So when you're work, when you're doing like a full package, let's say you're working with uh, Purpose or Rashad, do you produce as well? Like, do you say like, you know, hey, G, on your, on your fourth bar, you could have been a little tougher. I love the emotion, but let's fix that one part. Or do you just <laughs> provide the music and kind of trust the process? I do a little, I do a little of that. It depends. It depends because sometimes, um, like my mind's got to be in the right mindset. Uh, like, Oh, I really, you know, like I'm really focused on the MC. Like, like with Rashad, it was just too easy. Like I didn't need to do anything. This dude knew exactly what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's rare. That's a rare thing. Yeah, man. It was just like meant to be, man. Um, and there's some stories behind it, but, well, I mean, uh, hey, I mean, that's why we're here. We're here to, to hear the stories. I mean, let's you, you dove into it a little bit. Let, let's go all the way back. Can you tell me about growing up and maybe falling in love with hip hop? I mean, hip hop around that time was maybe only like, a, I don't know, a decade old at that point. You know, how how old were you when you latched on the music? What was it about it that kind of resonated with you? Um, I was uh, I was 10 years old. I was in fourth grade. And I. Uh, I had a friend, like my first friend. So I was from, I'm from Philadelphia. And uh, when I was like six, seven, we moved right outside and uh, out of Philadelphia. And, um, you know, at that point, I'd been in the elementary school, that same school for a few years. And then fourth grade, I actually, no, I met this dude in first grade. Our first friend, my first friend when I moved was Korean. He was like, yo, I got these tapes. Um, it's L Cool J and Run DMC. Like one side was L Cool J, the other side was Run DMC, and I never, I never heard them. I didn't even know what I was listening to. I, I have no idea. And uh, and he, I played it, and I was like immediately like, wow, like what is this? Like this sounds really good. 
And um, like that was like my fr- and then like it became like a Run DMC fascination from there. Like L Cool J, like you know, it's definitely still remember like in recess with like I need love, you know, all that stuff. But <laughs> but it was really Run DMC <laughs> I gravitated yeah. towards more. And um, I mean that was like the beginning phase of it. Uh, and then you know as I was getting older. Um, it'd be like, you know, at nine o'clock at night, they do like the top 10 countdown. It was all like real hip hop stuff. They would save like the real hip hop for like nighttime. So you had like Big Daddy Kane on there, EPMD. Um, so, you know, it was always like, you know what I mean? Like glued to your radio, listen to like top 10, you know, joints of whatever the time. And, um, you know, so it was just like a continuation of like, wow, who else is out there? We're, you know, what other groups can I get into? And and then like, um, you know, I was like 15. My brother, um, we were working down in Jersey in the shore one summer and they had a DJ outside. And uh, my brother got real into the DJ and, and the and he ended up buying uh, turntables with the money he made. And the DJ that was there, he sold him like a bunch of records. And my brother started scratching like, and he was like a natural at it. And I, I wasn't. And yeah, so but like, he would try to teach no, me. And it's interesting, you know. So like, I started trying to scratch, but he was he was just good right out of the gate. And um, and then from there, we bought a, a Gemini, a sampler. I think it was a 12 second sampler and we started buying some break records and we started our fascination with finding original samples. What, what was it? What was it like from your parents POV? Because they are, they're seeing their kids being lost to hip hop. I'll tell you, I, I grew up in the nineties and that's yeah. when they started putting parental advisory labels on CDs. So when I brought home like a eight ball and MJG CD or a, uh, I don't know the chronic or whatever I was listening to ghetto boys. <laughs> my mom would snap those CDs, throw them in the trash. Like you're not listening to that. But when you're introduced to it, your parents have no idea what hip hop is. How do they, uh, you know, are they kind of hovering? Like, what, you know, what are my boys listening to? Or you just had free reign. Like, we're, you know, we got sucked into this and we're just going to run with it. Yeah. I think it was free reign more or less. It was never like, I mean, one time I remember in the car, like uh, I played my dad, uh, the Ghetto Boys tape, I think they sampled Leonard Skinner on one of the the joints. Uh, and then I might have been with Minds Playing Tricks on Me, too. And, like, I knew that this shit was, like, crazy language. But I was like, Dad, you got to hear this. Like, I was like, shit, I hope I could play this for him. He's not going to flip out. And he didn't. <laughs> he didn't flip out. And, um, oh man, yes. Yeah, so, maybe because he recognized the melodies of like the music he grew up on. Because yeah, my mom would listen to it and she'd be like, "Oh, this rapper is stealing this beat." And I, I'm like, "No, they're not stealing it. They're sampling it and turning it into something beautiful." Yeah. But she didn't. She didn't see my POV on that. Nah, she clearly <laughs> didn't. And it might have helped too. My my dad had a record collection, um, so like he definitely like appreciated music. You know, jazz. He was big in the jazz. He still is big in the jazz. So. There might have been like some like underlying connection there that he just kept to himself. I don't. I don't know. So I mean, what comes first? Like, do you, like, is scratching comes first and then sampling? Is that kind yeah. of the natural progression? That's what happened. In fact, my brother started making like. Well, we both started like, you know, like looping a drum drum break, and you know, uh, early on, like Bob James was our, and still is uh, pretty much, you know our main sample dude like he was he's the man and um so we'd be like you know number one trying to recreate a couple things if we could if we had the right sounds and number two like trying to you know sample our own stuff and um you know one night he started he was making some beats that i wasn't even like involved i was in my room and i came out i remember man i was like the fuck how did you make that i was and I was like, yo, I got I to gotta get into this. And, like, that was really the start, man. Like, I, when I heard those beats, I'm like, yo, I got to make some I gotta make some beats like this. Because I really, I mean, we were just messing around. But he was doing his own thing at that point. 
And, and like from there, that was the beginning stages because um, like 99, I bought a keyboard. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know why I did that. Um, I mean, I liked it, but it's not really, you know, it's not what I really wanted. And then, you know, in, in 2001, I got the MPC and that was it was the beginning of the end. Well, if, if we're talking about... If we're talking about the like the beginning of the process, what what are like some good ones you remember like uh, in the journey of sampling or crate digging, right? Or you know, just discovery. Man, like I just finding original samples is like there's nothing better. There's nothing better. Um, I mean, because it just gives you like a feeling. Like I mean, for those that appreciate music, you know what I mean. Like you have to appreciate music to like appreciate hearing how the original was used and. Um, how it was made and so that that was always like a, a mission to find original samples um be it be it records once the internet started really you know napster like man for finding samples on napster it was so much fun oh man i, I love those days like yo i found this because like you know at the records you you had to have the money and the hip-hop and samples they started exploiting that a little bit more later on, but you know, you had that money to get the records. And I mean, we had some, but like sample based ones, you know, well, it, it's kind of like what, uh, what most devs said where you you guys are like coal miners. You're on the hunt to unearth that diamond. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because on top of that, like a, a good producer could put on a song and they know exactly what part to take of that song. And nothing else, because you know you have to have the ear to know what's good and what's not. So to dig through the whole song and be like, yeah, right there, or you know this piece, that piece, you have to know what to sample and what not to sample. Do you get caught up in finding unt- like, will you use a sample that's been done uh, just as long as you're able to put your own flavor on it, or like once, once, like it makes a wider net to cast. You know, do, do you see it as like, oh, this artist came to the apple tree. He picked the best fruit. Now here comes confidence, and he's going to get the second or third tastiest apple. Or does that analogy not apply in this case? I always taste the apple. So even if someone has has a, has a record and they they sample the thirty second, the forty second mark, maybe there's like the rest of the song like that yes. they missed, and it wasn't always the best choice. Like I can put my own flavor on it. That's right, but more times than not, there is nothing else because again, they found the best part. And, you know, early on it was loops, and then it was chops and, and whatnot. So when I say that, I'm saying, like, the loop-wise, um, they found the best part. Now, maybe it's played in a way where you can cut it up and rearrange it and stuff like that. But, I mean, yeah, I, I'm definitely trying it out to see if I can do something different with it. Because as long as it don't sound the same, who cares? No one's gonna, Some people probably won't even be able to recognize it. That's true. That's true. It's almost like, I don't know, or when I read stories about it or hear stories, it's almost like they want to get away f- nowadays from like clearing samples. Either they're, they're looping or manipulating enough to where they can get sued. But then you have like someone like Pharrell who just got sued by Marvin Gaye. And it's debatable if the melodies are similar. You know, it, it's always going to be debatable. But hell, they lost in court regardless, lost millions. In fact, I got this really cool story like two weeks ago. I talked to evidence from uh dilated peoples if anyone out there knows him and we talked about a story of him helping create the beat on kanye's college dropout uh it was the last song on the album called last call and they used a bed biddler sample called mr rockefeller and they couldn't clear it should they i don't know the process of clearing either she said no or they couldn't afford it so they manipulated it little twang here little chord change here Maybe they took a C chord or an F chord, you know, whatever they did. They brought in a musicologist, and every time they made a little change, they would look at the musicologist, and he would shake his head, no. All right, little chord change here. Then they would look at him. He would say, no. All right, well, let's change that C chord to an F chord. Then they look at the musicologist, and he gives them a thumbs up. And then it got me thinking, like, man, uh, you can bring in a musicologist who makes 70 grand a year, and you're relying on his professional opinion to not get sued for potentially millions of dollars. Sampling to me is like, it's such a fascinating process. And I really hope it doesn't die off too much because of like situations like that. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Did they end up playing it out live, or did they keep sampling and like pitching it and stuff like that? Super pitch. Yeah, if you listen to it, it's like super pitch. Like if you remember um, uh, Kanye's "Through the Wire," you know how like Shaka yeah. Khan was so high pitched yeah. that I think that's what they did. They changed it just enough to where if he 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 guaranteed if they were in court that they would win if they ever got challenged on it. Yeah, and that, it's cool. scary, you know. Yeah, that's cool. No, I mean, yeah, they got services now, but I, I mean, you know, it depends. If you're not making any money, no one's gonna sue you. I mean, <laughs> that's a that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, I mean that that's the way I look at it. Um, someone could be a ball buster and do it anyway, but again, like, what do you want? Okay, I'll just uh, I'll pull it from the shelf. You know, like, what else can I do? Can't give you any money. I don't know. And I think, and I heard your theory on, on, I think that's why DJ Premier started like really just chopping up his stuff beyond recognition. And I think it's really cool when you do something out of either, I don't know, laziness or absolute necessity or a workaround, it becomes like your signature move. Yeah. I did say that, didn't I? Yeah. I mean, I I had to do a little due diligence before I, uh, (laughs) before I talked to you. (laughs) But, you know, like the the, cool, the thing about this podcast is I'm not a music producer. So if I'm a music producer talking to another music producer, we're going to get lost in jargon. Yeah. I'm just I'm fascinated. I'm not a music producer, but I'm fascinated in the subject. People like you fascinate me. I just I want to know everything about your life story, about your process, your work. And then I figured there's an audience for people that think the same way I do. Yeah. Those that appreciate music. Hey folks, I hope you're enjoying the interview so far. If you like what you heard, hey, why not subscribe? Leave me an iTunes review. Lastly, check out the website, bedroombeethovens.com. Mucho appreciated. Now let's get back to our interview with confidence part two. the school of confidence because the url is gone yeah so is this still is this still an ongoing project it's not um i mean you know i did it for i mean i did it for like three years um it was great in the beginning uh you know but then it's one of those things kind of like it's not embarrassing but it's like damn i wish i i could have invested more into it um and keep it going even though like today's world it's not a giant audience for something like that at least for sample base um so i kind of just let it die but um it was you know it was a good experience man it was cool to like like i i I taught people like all over the world you know i definitely help people like people that didn't have a process that didn't understand certain things and elements and give them a, a way to to get structure and understand how to sample and you know, respecting the roots of sampling and, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it was a good experience, you know, I tried it, um, I, at least I tried it, you know, so. Yeah, when I, when I was learning about it, I was almost thinking that, uh, and you probably never thought of it this way, but I was thinking of it like an American Idol, like if I have a semester of this confidence school, wouldn't it be cool if I reflected back 10 years later and there's this dude winning Grammys or this really big star? That would be And good. man, he, yeah, he was in my class. Like, I helped him. Yeah, I went on to the school of confidence. <laughs> right? You know? It, it's almost like leaving a little bit of your legacy. That would really be great. Um, and you never know. That still can happen. So, yeah. No, I never thought of that, though. So thank you for bringing it up because that would be pretty cool. I, I I think that that idea, you should spark it back up because it's like, not only can I learn from somebody, but yeah, this dude has connections. He's been in the industry this long. And the, the thing I liked is like you had mentioned, you mentioned that you're going to help people with authentic hip hop production. Authentic. And for someone who doesn't know the difference, what's your definition of authentic compared to something that's not authentic? And why is this important during the early stages of learning? Authentic. I think it just comes down to uh, something that you can feel that has feeling and emotion in it. That's authentic to me. And um, a lot of music back then had that. And even in the 2000s. Um, but um, it's just that feeling like you 
I don't know, like it just does something to you. You just have to keep listening to it, you know, because it captures something in you. And um, that's authentic to me. And, you know, by saying that, like, I'm going to teach you how to make authentic music that will live on because it's authentic. It's not going to, like, die out, you know, like if you do it right, not everybody's going to do it right because not everybody has the ear to do it. Uh, but some people still try. But that's like anything, you know. People want to copy and think they can do it, but not everybody can. But to your original question, authenticity to me means capturing a certain feel or emotion in the music that shines that shines through to the listener. You, have you ever had an emotional response to music? Yes, chills. I've Tell got, me about that. I've got teary eyed. Have you? I've, I've, I'm envious of people that have gotten that way. I've, I'm still chasing that. Yeah, the chills though is slight chills. When when you get chills, ooh, you know you're on it. Something I don't care what anybody says. If you, if it does it to you, you know, like just keep going. You got something. Um, yeah. I mean, I can't. Like, all right. I, I I can't recount the chill, the, the times I get chills. Like, it doesn't happen every day. Um, but that's the thing. That's the good part. It's special, right? If it yeah. happened every day, like, yeah, I got the chills. Big deal. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. But if you right. get it, like, once every six months or whatever, they're like, wow, this is it. This is the real deal. But, like, the, the, the teary-eyed, like, I can remember that. Like, I'll tell you, I remember, I'll give you one main example. Uh, that was when... Uh, I was listening like back when uh, Moment of Truth dropped and I was listening to Moment of Truth and I started getting a little teary eyed. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Cause that shit was real, man. Although let me just, I, I, I got to cut you off because you did that, the squeeze remix. And I was just thinking about, man, what if there was a guru jazzmatazz of confidence beats and his lyrics over it? Yo, that fucking, that squeeze remix, yo, that's a chill beat for me, man. That's a chill. I, I got chills from that. That fucking beat goes so good. First of all, without Guru, just listening to it. And that, I, that anybody could have made that, I'd say the same thing. I just I just so happen to make it. But then with his voice over it, it's, it's just perfect. There's no flaw in in any of it. Shit, I know model citizens that ain't squeaky clean. You got dirty politicians, dirty judges, and dirty cops. Everyone's on the tape, the hood's filled with dirty blocks. How we gonna save the community? They worse than us. It's like a curse for us. Police be the first to bust. Think about it, that Rico shit's no fucking joke. For them, the evidence will vanish in a puff of smoke. I've been observant, I'll never be subservient. I guess you get what you deserve in this. From project always to courthouse always. Some prevail, won't see jail. This happens always. Speed on. Before you get peed on, all I need is more power, then I'm gonna put the squeeze on. I want more power, I'm gaining more truth. So yeah. I'm glad you heard it, man, because no one really fucking heard that shit. I mean, it's. I heard it, man. I'm not gassing you up either. Like a Jazzmatazz. It, it would have meld so well your beats with his lyrics. It's almost like a marriage. It would have been really good. I know. I wonder. I could probably be like, yo, Premier, like, I got an idea. Like, you gotta get this done. Like, but he already made Jazzmatazz. Jazzmatazz 3. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but no, I, I, hey man, I'm, I'm just glad you heard that. What'd you think of that shit? I thought it was great, man. I thought it was great. And it's like when, when you agreed to be on my show, I'll admit I, I dig a little bit on the guests, and then if they say yes, then I dig more. And I'm glad I did. I, I there was this other beat called Ready or Not. That shit was so damn smooth. Like What's it called? fucking expensive beer, Ready or Not. It was on one of your. Uh, it was just an instrumental. Oh, the instrumental. That you yeah. released. Man, like, yeah, like that. Those are the instrumentals that resonate with me. And if you find a lyricist that can just ride the beats, it's hard. That's the man. shit that I like. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to give back to the culture, man, to the music, and uh, 
you know, it's good to be recognized and when you know your work is at a level, a high level like that. You know what I mean? And because um, I know mine is because I've been doing it for so long. I, the, you can't tell me otherwise. And uh, the music speaks for itself. That That's the bottom line. You, know, you, you just said it. Ready or not. Wow. Crazy. That was the music. That wasn't me. I just I just brought it to life. I took the right sounds, man. You got to know what sounds to take, how to arrange it. And, you know, there's always learning. There's still more learning to do. Like, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a master at what I do, but I, a master that can still learn more too. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, there's something about hip hop too. That's, that's really discouraging for me. It's like in just about everything else, the more you do it, you get better at it. If I'm a, if I'm a jogger and I jog for 15 years, and you come up to me and you're like, are you a good jogger? And I'm like, yeah, I'm an awesome fucking jogger. I've been jogging for 15 years. That doesn't necessarily translate into, you know, let's take Nas's Illmatic. That's heralded as his best album. And he came out with that shit when he was 19. Why isn't a 40-year-old Nas better than a 19-year-old Nas? It's almost discouraging because that analogy doesn't really lend itself to hip hop. Well, what you said is true, except for the fact that the 40-year-old Nas won't sound like a 19-year-old Nas because he don't have the right production. I mean, why did you fall in love with that album? Was it just what he was saying? Or was it the music to bring it all together? That's highly debatable because people are going to say, oh, he's a he's a poet. Yo. But we all know it was the Pete Rock. It was yeah, the premiere. It was the, yeah. yeah there's, no, yeah. there's no song without a beat. I don't care how good your lyrics are. I'm not listening to acapellas all day. But I listen to instrumentals all day. There's no discussion. I don't care what anybody says, man. If they don't understand that, then. I'm, I'm glad you said that because that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast. I, I feel like I should put that quote on a T-shirt. <laughs> that's the way I look at it. How could you listen to somebody just talk all day long? It's not even a podcast. They're, they're, they're like rhyming and to maybe telling a story. But like, damn, like, can I get some music to go along with that? Can I get some fries with that shake? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when we're talking about a little earlier about like the authentic hip hop production, you said that uh, you have to train your ears. Yes. How how do you do that? How, or maybe not even as a as a listener. What do seasoned producers hear that novices don't? First of all, the main thing is like when you're listening to music that you want to sample, you might like something. You're like, oh, that sounds good, but then you have to think, well. I like it, but will it translate into hip hop? Right? Because mm-hmm. just because it sounds good don't mean it's going to sound like hip hop. It could just be a nice piece of music. But does it have the right feel to capture like that hip hop sound? And then when you sample it, you'll be like, damn, it don't really sound that good with the drums over it. And you move on. If you don't move on, then you're never going to understand what it takes to sacrifice and to put in the hours and hours and hours to fine tune that sound until you know, yes, this will sound, this is hip hop right here. I'm going to sample this. And for me, I don't really loop stuff very often. So for me, it's really like taking pieces of music and chops of music and rearranging it. And the same principle applies. Like when you have that hit, you know, that one second sound, is that sound like hip hop? When it's on the pad, when you hit the pad and hit the drum, does that sound like hip hop? You have to be able to distinguish what works and what doesn't. And then when you build upon that your foundation of what you what you've created, when you want to add on to it, the same principle applies. But not only that, then whatever you add isn't gonna take it to the next level. Because if you're not doing anything to enhance it, then what are you really doing? How are you making this better than what it is? You gotta keep building and building until you like you got a house. And you're like, yo, I can move into this shit. Otherwise, can you move into it? It's like, well, it looks good, but that window's a little broken, man. It might be cold in there in the winter. I don't know if I wanna really buy that. Because it's gotta be everything's gotta be tip top shape. And that's what it's all about. So you don't get bogged down with the equipment you're using? No. I mean, I've been using the same thing for 18 years. It's not about the equipment. It's about your ear. It's about your, your creative abilities. You use your resources, whatever you have. Um, you make it work because uh, it, it can it can do just enough. And the rest is up to you. 
Yeah, you gotta you gotta open that school back up because these are teachable things. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I I you know touched on these types of sort of principles you know during that that time. Um, but you know, not everybody's gonna get it. They'll be like, yeah, I I know what you're saying, but like that's one thing. But the other is like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Like no matter what, because that makes sense. You know, like it's different than as always. Like um, knowing and doing. You know what I mean. Some yeah. will do, some will know. And the ones that know won't really get anywhere because um, not that what I'm saying is the gospel, but just the idea of like applying something, you know what I mean? It's a, and it has to resonate with you in order to really apply it. And it's tough. It's not easy. But uh, if you really are devoted and committed, then you have to take action. So here we are in, in early 2019. What, what are your plans for the year? I know, you know, like I said, people are clamoring for new music. Um, any anything in the, in the pipes? Well, let me ask you something. Sure. Did you hear the album Confidence Presents G. Don and Born featuring Ed O.G.? Uh, Ed O.G. has been on my radar for a little bit. Um, I didn't digest it fully, though. Are you are you planning to take that single and kind of flush it out? Well, I, I it came out in 2014. I'm just right. curious if... I mean, because that album, unfortunately, didn't get... Even the same, even though like the Rashad and Purpose weren't like huge, it didn't even get that same type of attention. And I feel like a lot of people missed out on it, unfortunately. So you feel like it should have got a bigger uh, audience than it did? Well, of course, but I understand why it didn't, you know. So, you know, I, I was just curious if you, because when I talk to people, they'd be like, yeah, the Rashad album, the Purpose album, Rashad album, the Purpose album. But they never really touch on the other one. And that for was, some reason, those those are the two that get the most shine. They do, uh, and I I don't know if it's because they get vinyl releases, or if your help. distribution pushes it out more, or you shot an official video for it. Yeah, we had videos. Uh, we had like three videos for that, uh, maybe even four. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was the promotion and the uh, distribution. Like it just wasn't that great, and um, I you know fortunately, I mean, there's definitely people that still bump it and like hit me up about it. But you know, again, I don't think it. It reached as far as it could have. We're working with this group, uh, these two brothers called Third Son out of Tennessee. And, um, you yeah, know, they're, they're nice. And so we're, we're doing like, we're trying to do like an EP together. And we already, we got one joint, well, we got like two joints done, um, which is which is good. They're, they're, they're good. They they sound good. Like yeah, they can rap, but they also sound good, which is more important to me at this point. Um, and then purpose and I, believe it or not, after all these years, um, we already got three three joints done, and we're working on trying to do an EP. It might might be more. Outside that, I mean, you know, the Rashad stuff. I I got joints with Rashad that we did like for years. Um, it just haven't been put out. It should be out this year. It should have been out last year. Um, so, I, me personally, I don't even want to put anything out with a shot. Like, why tarnish what we already did with, like, a single or maybe something else? Um, just leave that shit alone because, like... Whose decision is that? Um, well, at the time, like, again, like, this should have been out, like, last year or maybe even before. Uh, you know, Ill Adrenaline um, approached me with it. I was like, all right, yeah, whatever, let's do it. But, like, you know, I thought about it. I'm like, I mean, maybe a single is okay. It could just be a single. But, like, an album, I, it's not complete. It wouldn't be worth it. Why tarnish the reputation, the legacy, if you will, of it? Uh, I guess I could live with a single. But uh, I don't know. Anything after that, unless it was official, it would be a waste. But, I mean, because I haven't put nothing out since official, like, a project in five years. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. All this damn music, I'm just sitting around with it. it, it it's almost like um, you, you got 2019 locked on music. It's it's the marketing and promotion, yeah. a little bit of frustration. Once we once we iron that out, you might you might get a bigger shine than you than that you've always deserved. I feel, and 2019 might just be that year where you figure everything out. 
I, I got one last thing for you. Are you, you're in Boston right now, right? Is that where you reside? Yep, that's right. What, what about like a man? Get like Big Shug terminology. All those all those people that rep Boston and get like a because uh, I feel like Boston's not on the map as strong as it used to be. Yeah, I, I worked with Shug a while ago. Actually, we that's a whole other story. We we had three joints done um, for his first album, but it didn't make the album. <laughs> it, it was premiere all over the place, if I recall. Uh, yeah, he definitely had like probably what I don't know three or four joints, maybe maybe more. Yeah, who's hard? Was that the first one? Yeah, with the he was uh, in front of the he was in front of that gray background with the yeah. star like his logo. Yeah, I had three oh, joints man. that we did recorded and everything. We, I did Jason. I, I worked with Ed OG. I did Twice Dial. E D uh, E Devious made uh, yeah. made men. You remember them? You probably I don't, don't know them. They were uh-uh. Boston's first like real like rap group. Um, e Devious, he was part of Made Man with Ray Benzino. You remember? See, I'm I'm from Texas, so it needs to be really far reaching. Okay. if it's gonna if it's gonna hit us on that level. Yeah, I feel you. But like out here, <laughs> like they're like legends from like this era, that era. And I I work with him. I did uh, three joints on his first solo album in 2002. So like literally a year after I got my MPC, I already had like my first placement with like an official dude. And um so I mean I've definitely I've worked with a lot of Boston people actually over the years. Um I mean the the LOG would be my most prominent because, you know, with that album with G Don and Born, like we did like I think I did like five, six joints with him for that album. Mm-hmm. And uh yeah, pretty sick. It was some good so you time. you do these beats and then like when the album comes out, that's when you're like, oh, I wonder, if, did I make the cut or it, it can't be like a surprise like that. There has to be discussions beforehand, though. Um, the Big Shook stuff was totally different and it was on some other stuff and I didn't know. Put it like that. I didn't know I didn't make yeah. the cut, even though I should have made the cut because he has some he, he recorded some real, real shit over the beats like family singing story it wasn't just like a throwaway beats but it was it was another reason why i believe it was another i know i believe i know the reason why but i don't have proof that that was the reason why we can't get into it <laughs> uh, I, I guess it probably doesn't matter i mean it's so long ago i have rec- uh, i was recording with this other dude i think he ended up like just with us messing around he ended up rhyming on one of the same beats that I had that Shug was gonna was was already on. I was like, damn, he sounds good on this. And uh my my friend was like, yo, just tell Shug like some this dude wants to buy the beat, because like, Shug wasn't paying for the beats. And uh I was like, all right. And I told him. He was like, Yeah, that's cool. Like, you know, do what you gotta do, get your money. And like at, once I did that, yo, none of the joints made the album. Oh, now you man. tell me. That sounds a little I always thought, like, man, I, I think this dude got heated because I was like, "Yo, this dude wants to buy this beat," and like, I'm, I'm giving up a beat with Big Shug to be to be with some other dude. And I feel like, like I said, I don't have proof. Either way, it's a, it's one of the great hip hop tragedies. It kind of is, yo, because I, I mean, he told me he was like, "Yo, man, like, man, like the beats you got, like people around here don't make beats like this." I mean, he told me that, and I was like, "Yo, I appreciate, thank you." You know, I was like, "You're right." Yeah. I, it's true because I'm not from here. Number one. I mean, I want to I want to end the, the episode on a good note by giving you my undying thanks because this is a new podcast and a lot of people might look at it and be like, "Man, he's only like a couple episodes deep." I'm not going to give him the time, but you're nice enough to do this, man, and I really appreciate it. No problem. Like I said, man, I appreciate that. You know, after five years of not putting out a project, you're like, "Yo, man, I still want to talk to this dude." You know what I mean? So it's a win win. Yeah, for sure. And I'm going to get that gold vinyl. I don't care if it costs me $200. I do I'm have a copy of the gold vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> if I see it on Discogs one of these days, I'm going to snatch it up. <laughs> yeah, no, man, I know, man. I feel you. It was, it was limited pressing, and they went pretty quick. <laughs>